Welcome to our third lecture on labor law. So let's begin. As you know, in our first lecture, we talked a lot about the Wagner Act. And sometimes we talked a little bit about Taft-Hartley, but um, in the next section of this lecture, the last section, we're gonna talk more extensively about the Taft-Hartley Act and the Landrum-Griffith Act. Griffin Act. We're not going to be talking nearly as much about the Wagner Act. Again, I'm not going to test you. Is this in the Wagner Act? Is this in the Taft-Hartley Act? Is this in the Landon Griffin Act? But it's a really useful way of getting things sorted to telling the story about how the law changed over time. So that's what I'm telling you. Not that I'm going to test you over it, but if you have the information organized this way, I think you're going to find it a lot easier to remember the relevant facts. So in the first two lectures, we discussed the history of unionization. We did an overview of the Wagner Act, which of course is the original version of the National Labor Relations Act. We talked about how union campaigns and elections proceed. We discussed the collective bargaining process, which ideally results in a collective bargaining agreement. And we discussed what happens when collective bargaining doesn't result in a contract and that oftentimes is strikes and picketing. We discuss uh, unfair labor practices, both the ones provided in the Wagner Act, which are the ones that identified employer unfair labor practices. And then we talked about the Taft-Hartley amendments to the act, which discuss union unfair labor practices. And now we're gonna focus on the Taft-Hartley Act. Again, these, this is an amendment to the Wagner Act, the original National Labor Relations Act. So the Taft-Hartley Act is part of the National Labor Relations Act, it's changes to those laws. We've already talked a lot about uh, right to work laws, but we'll do a little bit of a refresher. And then we'll also discuss the Landrum Griffin Act, which is again, another set of amendments to the National Labor Relations Act. So if you combine Wagner, Taft, Hartley, and Landrum Griffin, that gets you the National Labor Relations Act. Finally, we'll talk briefly about public sector unions. We don't talk a lot about the public sector in this course, we focus on the private sector. So this is gonna be a really brief treatment. You're going to have a whole other course just about um, the, uh, the public sector unions, but we don't have that time. So let's get started. So the Taft-Hartley Act. Again, I think it's really helpful to have a perspective on this. The Great Depression is over. World War II is over. Um, there is the view in the country, widely held, though certainly not held by everyone, that the unions have become too powerful. And much of that is a function of uh, the uh, 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 Wagner Act uh, protections for unions. And so the idea is to level the playing field to rebalance the power within the employer union relationship. Another name for the Taft-Hartley Act is the Labor Management Relations Act. Now, I've never heard it actually called that. I've always heard it called the Taft-Hartley Act, but this is another name out there for the act, so FYI. Okay, so what does this do? So we're gonna have a list of things that this that did. Some of it is new stuff. Some of it is changing the stuff that was in the original Wagner Act. We've already discussed closed shops. Those are unlawful under the National Labor Relations Act and Taft-Hartley accomplished that. Again, if you don't remember what a closed shop is, here's the definition. An arrangement in which an employer agrees to hire union current union members only. Um, this is different than a union shop. Remember, in a union shop, the employer decides who to hire. That person may or may not be a member of the union. And then in a union shop situation, in a non-right-to-work state, then the uh, union can require that that person join the union if that is part of the collective bargaining agreement. Union shops are lawful. Closed shops are unlawful. Make sure you understand the distinction there because it's a really important one. Um, supervisors can't be members of the union. Um, and uh, the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Act, has to enjoin. Enjoin is a legal term for stop um, uh, unions from engaging in secondary boycotts. Again, we discussed this topic in uh, the uh, last uh, lecture, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. And then another thing that the NLRB can enjoin is jurisdictional strikes. We have not talked about this yet, so I'm gonna pause and kind of flesh this topic out in a little bit more. So what is a jurisdictional strike? Now, I don't put this in red because it's not something I'm gonna test you over, but since I'm talking about it, I felt like I ought to at least describe what I'm talking about. So when we talk about the word jurisdiction in the law, we're usually talking about the authority of a court to decide a particular case. 
That's not what we're talking about here. So this is a very different meaning for the word jurisdiction. And so I like to identify that because it's confusing if you don't know that kind of going in. So the idea is that a union has a particular level of, of, of responsibility or its employees have a certain piece of the pie, so to speak. Um, so let's say that you have a, a company that has this Teamster department and a laborers department um, and a, uh, I'm drawing a blank on other unions names, but uh, another union name, we'll say unions A, B, and C, let's say. And let's say that union A uh, has always done the shipping department and union B does the packing and union C does the manufacturing. Well, let's say that uh, union A starts doing some of the manufacturing. Well, Union C is going to say, wait a second, that's our deal. We're not doing shipping. We get it. That's your deal. Our deal is manufacturing. So any manufacturing that ha happens ought to be done by a member of our union. And so there is a jurisdictional quarrel then about which union gets assigned this task. And many times when there's technological innovations, this becomes an issue. Uh, because there's this technology advancement, maybe certain jobs are being eliminated or maybe the logic of who ought to do a particular job has changed. And this can cause obviously some territorial issues. Obviously the, the Union C is worried about uh, losing um, some of its membership because um, maybe there won't, let's say the uh, Union C currently has 100 members who work in this facility. Well, if suddenly 10% of the work is done by Union A employees, then that may mean that the employer needs fewer uh, a Union C employees, which is obviously going to negatively impact those workers and ultimately would negatively impact the union in terms of dues. So the union is going to fight pretty strongly and, and it's reasonable that it would fight pretty strongly to keep that work in the particular purview of that union. And of course, it can be a dispute between young unions, which is very common, or it can be a dispute between a union work and non-union work in a facility that has a combination of both. So you're not supposed to strike over these particular disputes, uh, but the NLRB can resolve those disputes uh, to decide who actually has uh, the authority over this particular topic. Um, another thing that the Taft-Hartley required, keep in mind this is during the time that there was uh, the Soviet Union was uh, taking over uh, much of Eastern Europe. Uh, there was definitely the concern about communism spreading. And uh, so there was a lot of concern about communism in the United States. It was perceived at that time that there was a real threat to democracy and to our system of government and our economy uh, by the red threat. At least that was how it was viewed. Didn't end up coming to pass, but you don't have a few crystal ball. You don't know what's going to happen. And so as a result, there was a concern that communists might be involved in some unions. And in fact, some communists were involved in unions. They may have been perfectly uh, law-abiding communists, but that idea associated with them was very concerning. You may say, communists, that's kind of crazy. We don't have communists running around. Well, that may be true now, but keep in mind, before the Soviet Union developed into the country that it ended up being with gulags and lots of oppression, and things like that, being a communist was perceived by many intellectuals as a very legitimate political perspective. It didn't have the nasty reputation that it does nowadays. And so lots of people did have, I don't say lots, but, but there were a number of people in intelligentsia, especially on the East Coast, that uh, had a period of time where they had flirted with communism before World War II. And so uh, the concern about union officials being communists uh, was real at that time. And uh, members in certain positions had to certify that they, in fact, were not communists. Now, we might look upon that as an abridgment of freedom of speech and freedom of association. Uh, but again, those were just the, the way things were back then. Probably not nearly as much of an issue today. Uh, authorize, uh, the act also authorized certain injunctions against unions for specific LL ULPs, and we'll talk more about those as we go forward in this unit. We've already discovered many of those already. It also, as we already said, also made union shop agreements illegal if they were contrary to state law. So this is where we get the right to work requirements. 
Um, we've pretty much already covered all this, so I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It recognizes 60 day, no strike, no lockout. So this is what the union can do. And this is what the employer can do. So during the 60 day period, neither the union nor the employer can do this when either party is seeking to cancel an existing collective bargaining agreement. This is like a cooling off period. Hey, wait a second, emotions are running high right now. Let's chillax here for a second. Let's catch our breath. Let's see how we can solve this problem without escalation. And it also required unions to file certain financial reports with the Department of Labor. We'll also see that there will be additional uh, documents that have to be filed in the Landrum Griffin Act. And uh, it established the Federal Mediation and Conciliation Service, and it stopped employers' payments to union officials. As I said before in their last lecture, once upon a time, companies would pay off the union, um, and the union and the employer would basically be cheating the employee. So instead of the employees getting the wage rate, the, the wage increases or the benefit increases, the employer would, would instead pay the union, and then the union would would not negotiate quite so hard for on behalf of the employees. Obviously, that was uh, always immoral behavior on the part of the employer and the union, but it wasn't necessarily illegal until Taft-Hartley. So here are some uh, union acts that became unlawful. And again, these fall under the ULP, unfair labor practices. So they cannot restrain or coerce employees in the selection of bargaining representatives. So this could be during the union campaign, for example. Cannot cause an employer to discriminate against employee based upon his union or non-union position. In other words, the employee and the union can't say to the employer, we want you to fire Bob because he's against the union. Um, or, you know, we'll, we'll accept uh, less pay for our workers if you'll just go ahead and fire Bob. And of course, the union cannot refuse to bargain in good faith with the employer. The employer under Wagner couldn't fail to engage in a good faith collective bargaining. And now that onus was also on the union. So what are the ways that you can see bad faith? We've already talked about these, but just a refresher. Either the employer or the union can refuse to attend bargaining sessions. Hard to bargain in good faith when you're not present, right? Uh, either the union or the employer can refuse to present proposals. And this is probably the one that's most common is they can refuse to uh, present the necessary information to the other side. So if the employer says, we're not profitable, we can't afford a wage increase. Well, the union is entitled to know, well, show us, show us your book so we can see exactly how profitable you are. Or if an employer says uh, the competing employers in this market don't uh, pay any more than this, so we don't want to offer more than this, then the union is going to say, well, show us those, those surveys that you've done so we can see if, uh, if those are accurate. And of course, the union has the same obligation to do all of these steps as well. We've already talked about secondary boycotting, so I'm not going to talk about that. Requiring excessive initiation uh, fees or, um, sure, I have continuing there. Excessive initiation uh, fees or uh, dues, excessive dues. Used to be the case, again, before Taft Hartley, that um, the initiation fee could be very, very large. Um, and of course, current members of the union weren't concerned about initiation fees because they either didn't ever have to pay it or um, they uh, no longer had to pay it. It was just for the newcomers. So the union could um, you know, become a club that the person had to join in order to stay employed there in a, a non-right-to-work state, and yet they could have a huge fee that the employee had to pay before he could continue employment past, say, the 30-day point. And so the Taft-Hartley eliminated both huge dues and excessive initiation fees. Feather bedding, we haven't talked about a lot, but this is when you hire, when you uh, require that employer hire workers that really are not needed to perform work. Um, uh, this uh, it was unlawful, again, since the 1940s, but it continued to some extent even until modern times. Um, the, uh, 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 the, the way that uh, it, it did for a time is even when, uh, this is an example, kind of a funny example, 
is that once um, trains stopped using coal uh, to uh, power them, they would still have the union workers who were the coal shovelers uh, be working there, have shovel in hand, even though there was no coal for them to shovel. But they were allowed to keep that job even though they were doing nothing of value. That would be an example of feather bedding. So again, that, that is unlawful. And there can't be union recognition picketing for more than 30 days but without filing a petition for election. Now we've already, I think, talked about hot cargo agreements, but if we haven't, a hot, or maybe we haven't, is a hot cargo agreement is an agreement between a union and an employer that bars the employer from using the products made in a non-union shop. Those products from the non-union shop are the hot cargo, kind of like a hot potato. You can't handle it. And so the employer, obviously in this case, a union employer would not buy from that company that's non-union. Uh, and then these contracts obviously are unlawful. Uh, the, an employer cannot be limited in where it buys products from, and the employer can buy from union or non-union shops, depending upon its business judgment. So that's an overview of Taft-Hartley. We've, we've already obviously covered the Wagner Act. Now we're ready for the third part of the National Labor Relations Act, the Landrum-Griffin Act. And here we go, Landrum-Griffin Act. Okay, and this also has another name. Again, you'll never hear it called this, but let me just say it so it's on the record. The Labor Management Reporting and Disclosure Act. Again, this is all an amendment to the National Labor Relations Act or the Wagner Act. So this is passed really at the height of the Red Scare. This is back when Joe McCarthy was uh, creating a lot of mayhem in the Congress by calling people communists and things like that. So the concerns about the infiltration of communists was even greater at this moment in history. And uh, again, this was a time that people were very concerned about the power of unions. Uh, people like Jimmy Hoffa and other people, uh, many of whom were actually involved in organized crime. Some probably weren't. Uh, some of them, uh, you know, maybe were, were accused of things that they weren't guilty of, but many of them were guilty of this. And there was a, potentially, and, and sometimes in reality, a lot of corruption in some unions. Um, and uh, the, the workers who were members of the union were oftentimes not being treated appropriately. So this law was designed to give the workers, the members of the union information and give them more control over the union. Because of course the idea of unionization is that it be democratic in many parts of the country that it ceased to be the reality. Um, though certainly that wasn't the case everywhere. So this was in response to congressional investigations. I think those investigations may have been led by Bobby Kennedy into union corruption. I could be mistaken about that. And it provides a bill of rights for union members, what they are entitled to expect from their union, uh, that they, they have the enforceable right to, to get that. And it also describes how union elections will happen. Now, this isn't about whether the, the particular employer will go to union, but this is about the internal elections that happen within a union to elect its officials, for example. Um, and then there were safeguards to union funds, um, and these were also accomplished through ERISA. Uh, there was a fair amount of corruption in union funds, uh, and this was designed to reduce that because, of course, many workers didn't necessarily have a pension through the employer, but instead had a pension through the union. So if the union was doing some funny accounting, um, then, of course, the workers could end up being in a very bad position. This actually happened to my grandfather. My grandfather, when he was about 62, um, uh, learned that he had no retirement through his place of employment. He had worked there as a printer uh, for, I don't know, 20, 30 years, and there was no money for him. Um, and so that happened to, unfortunately, many, many uh, unions. Now, this happened well after 59, but uh, the point is that uh, no legislation is going to cure all, the, all the, the dangers, all the risks that, that can arise in these situations. Okay. Of course, many employer pensions before um, ERISA and the um, uh, 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 Pension Guarantee and Benefits Corporation came into existence. That sometimes happened for, with employer-funded uh, pensions as well. So uh, I'm not trying to say it's only a union issue, it can be an employer issue. Nowadays, 
workers have guaranteed pensions um, it, it, and through the, the pension guarantee, uh, pension and benefit guarantee corporation. Um, if they have been promised benefits, the employer has to pay certain benefits into this corporate government corporation. And so the, the person's pension is going to be safe to the extent that as it exists at the moment that um, those actions happen. Now, obviously, a company can still go bankrupt and there won't be any additional payments into the pension. Okay, so let's talk about how a union, what union, ha union members have a right to. They have the right, according to Landrum Griffin, to attend all union meetings. Now keep in mind, in a right to work state, the people who are in the bargaining unit but who have not joined the union and do not pay union dues, they don't have a right to attend the meetings and they won't be welcome to attend the meetings. But if you are a union member paying union dues, you can't be excluded from the meetings. This was a change as a result of Landrum Griffin. They also, if they're a union member, have the right to vote on union business. Uh, for example, to ratify or not ratify union contracts, to vote on uh, the uh, leadership, the president and vice president of the union, uh, to vote on important decisions the union is making. Also, union members can nominate candidates for various positions within the union. They can sue the union uh, if the union has violated some of these rules. Um, and if a union member is disciplined by the union, required to pay a fine or some other discipline because of something that he or she did or didn't do, that union member is entitled to a full and fair hearing before the union. Let's consider some other aspects of the Landrum Griffin Act. Okay, so there are safeguards for protecting union funds and assets, so it's much more difficult for the union leadership to walk off with the money um, to, to abscound with it, kind of, so to speak. And there has to be a lot more disclosure of the accounting that's happened. Uh, how much the union leadership is paid is now a matter of public record. And again, those records are sent to the Department of Labor. This is one of the main sources of information that employers use during those meetings, those uh, uh, pre-election meetings. So they can let the employees know this is how much, if you join this union, you pay union dues, this is what the structure of the union is, this is what the re economic reporting uh, statements that the union has made. Um, and of course, they're available for the, for the members as well as the employers to see. Uh, secret election is the, there's a secret ballot procedure for electing union leaders. Uh, union funds can't be used to try to reelect the per current people who are running the union. And we've already talked about the limitations on communists and felons in having uh, leadership roles. There are fiduciary leaders. Every union officer has fiduciary duties regarding the assets of the union. A fiduciary duty is like the duty that an attorney or an accountant has towards his or her clients. Uh, in that situation, those individuals, just like the union officials, have the duty to handle the money not for their own personal benefit, but for the benefit of whoever actually owns the money, in this case, the union. So now we've completed the Wagner Act, the Taft-Hartley Act, and the Landrum-Griffin Act. So we've completed our review of the National Labor Relations Act, and now we're going to discuss briefly public sector unions. Okay, so let's talk a little conceptually about the differences between the public sector and the private sector. Obviously, private sector employers are fi focused on making a profit. That's their deal, right? Public sector employers don't make a profit. Uh, they're focused on uh, governing, and uh, sometimes that may, may be focused on getting reelected or having their leaders be reelected. Um, and so the, the motivations that these entities have are fundamentally different. As a result, public sector employers usually don't fight unionization very hard. After all, those people in the union or potentially in the union are people that could vote for their leaders. And obviously the decision about how to handle uh, an, an effort to organize isn't made by the uh, non-political people within a government branch, but it's made by the leadership, by the uh, people uh, you know, at the governor level or the presidential level. 
and they usually take the view of those are potential voters we don't want to rock the boat um, and so as a result there isn't uh, nearly as much campaigning to uh, limit or stop unionization and another factor is that jobs can't really be shipped offshore um, if a, a partic particular ro role is is happening within a governmental agency, it's going to stay there. Uh, of course, one of the major reasons that we've lost so many uh, uh, good, well-paying union jobs is that there were other places in the world who, whose workers were willing to do that same work for significantly less money. And that's kind of, you know, unfortunately, an inevitable part of uh, the arrangement of those various you know, specialties. Certain parts of the world specialize in certain things. As a result, there's a fair number of public employees who are covered by unions. And in fact, remember at the beginning of our first lecture, we talked about how in the 70s and since, there's been a significant decline in private sector unionization. So the public sector is a much bigger piece of the union pie, and it has suffered a much less dramatic drop in unionization. Um, many states allow collective bargaining agreements for many of their public employees. Um, uh, for example, public teachers in many states can collectively bargain. Uh, in Texas does not permit collective bargaining uh, by its public sector employees. And for the most part, the federal government doesn't allow um, uh, you know, uh, nearly as much as many states would, would allow. As a result, in Texas, we have very few public unions that really have any uh, authority or control. They may talk about it, but their ability to affect public policy is very limited. And so uh, most members of the public sector do not choose to join those unions because it's not necessarily the best investment of their money. And usually the public sector employees either don't have the right to collectively bargain, or even if they do, they don't have the right to strike. So uh, county, state, and municipal public employees can participate. Again, this is usually in, um, in other states more so than ours, but in lots of different vehicles for membership. The AFL-CIO is the large umbrella organization that most unions of any size are members of. Um, and so it's kind of a, a tent where all the unions kind of are part. Um, but there are other organizations that don't necessarily participate under the AFL-CIO banner. Again, um, the public sector is not going to have strikes. Uh, the private sector, oftentimes there will be strikes. In the public sector, even when striking is unlawful, it's not unusual to see public sector employees engaging in work slowdowns or what is oftentimes called the blue flu. This is oftentimes related. I think, I think I'm not, I, could, I could be mistaken about this, but my impression is that the blue flu is a reference to police officers, is in they wear blue uniforms. And police officers are usually not permitted to strike. So what they will do sometimes, and this is not right to do, so I'm not saying that all police officers would do this by any means, but it has happened, let me put it that way, where police officers will call in sick. Um, and so this term is developed and in fact, the term is used even for workers uh, who aren't police officers to, to use this term when they're prohibited from striking. They call up their boss and say, uh, 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 I can't come to work today, uh, 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 I'm sick today. And suddenly there's a rash of flu cases. And so the, uh, the employer realizes, well, this is essentially a strike without calling it a strike. And uh, sometimes they will uh, get the government to uh, penalize the union, because the, oftentimes the union is behind this, or sometimes the employer will just uh, give in because that may be the easiest path. So at this point, we've talked about the history of unionization. We've covered the Wagner Act, which is the main part of the NLRA. We've discussed how union campaigns and elections proceed. We've talked about the collective bargaining process and what happens when that process doesn't result in a contract, for example, strikes and picketing. We've discussed unfair labor practices, both the ones that employers can commit and employee and uh, unions can commit. Employees can if they're 
doing on the behest of unions, but generally speaking, just employees can't come in unfair labor practices. We discussed the Taft-Hartley Act, an amendment to the NLRA. We discussed the Landrum-Griffin Act, also an amendment to the NLRA, and we've discussed the public sector unions. So let's kind of distill what we've talked about to get some hints as to how to proceed if you're representing the employers. Um, so um, if your employees are considering unionization, you are advising, or when your client's employees are considering unionization, and you're advising them about the, the, the client about how to proceed, keep in mind that you cannot interfere in the process. You can provide information, you can help the employee make the decision, but you shouldn't interrupt the process or uh, interfere with the employees making that decision. And before the client does anything, the client should re receive expert legal advice from a, a practitioner in labor law. Um, and in fact, many employment lawyers would not be qualified to give this type of advice. And the secret is when you are communicating to, with employees is you always have to provide accurate information. And of course, you have to remember tips. I won't go over it again, but these are the good summary of what you can and cannot do. Empo when you talk to an employee, you can't assume, no matter what the employee says, that that employee will be on your side or that employee will keep whatever you've said to him or her confidential. Um, it's very likely that some people that your client thinks are on its side is, are really on the side of the union, or at least uh, the, the, the loyalty lines may be more complicated than uh, the, what the uh, employee is representing to management. Uh, know how the employer can support employees as they make the decision about whether to unionize or not. Know what's lawful to do and what's not lawful to do and make sure that the client knows that and that the client knows that at lots of different levels. It's not enough that the senior management and facility know. It's not enough that HR knows. The most important people to know are the rank and file supervisors, people that may not earn much more than the hourly paid folks, people that may have just graduated from college last year, or maybe haven't graduated from college yet. Uh, and those folks need a lot of training uh, because they probably know very little about this process. Um, if a union is in place in your facility, in other words, the union election has been won by the union, you have to make sure that you only negotiate with the union representatives. You can't talk directly to employees about uh, the terms and conditions of employment. And of course, if there is, if you are dealing with the union, you have to be sure that you're bargaining in good faith, that you are sincerely trying to reach an agreement. And of course, you have to know what the law requires and do it. The laws in this area are not always intuitive, and it does involve educating the employee, the employer, the client employer, about how these things work. To avoid the unionization, keeping the lines of communication open with the non-union employees is really important. If the facility is unionized, you need to make sure you're, you're communicating well and developing as good a relationship as you can with the union because if you have a bad relationship with the union, that oftentimes will result in you having a bad relationship with your unionized employees, which is not gonna make for a productive work environment. So you want to avoid that us versus them, management versus the union mentality to the extent that you can. It's not always possible. Uh, sometimes the union likes to pit the management against the union. Sometimes management wants to pit management against the union. That's not helpful at the end of the day for either side. Um, yes, it's appropriate for the employer to bargain hard during the collective bargaining process. That doesn't conflict with bargaining in good faith, uh, but you have to do it in a way that isn't going to spring or cause a meritorious ULP claim from the union. There's a saying out there, and that is employers often get the union they deserve, and that's a very helpful thing to think about. Good employers, employers who treat their employees well, who comply with the law, who provide accurate information, usually stay union free. And if they do get a union, they usually have a good working relationship with the union because they treat the union just like they treat their employees with respect, with straight dealing, in a uh, honest and uh, 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 way that it has integrity and ethical way.
And then usually in those situations, they get a good relationship with the union. And so an employer that has a bad relationship with the union, usually there's some responsibility on the part of the employer for that relationship not being what it ought to be. Doesn't mean that the employer can't turn it around, but it does mean that you kind of get what you pay for here. If you make bad choices, no, you aren't gonna have a good relationship with your employees and no, you're not gonna have a good relationship with your union. I hope that this presentation has been helpful. We're done with unionization now. Um, it's a very, very interesting topic. I hope I've captured some of the interesting twists and turns of it. I thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, as always, stop by my office hours. Thank you for your attention and have a wonderful day.